To the people of the galaxy, the Grand Army of the Republic came out of nowhere, emerging just in time for the Battle of Geonosis as a well-trained, fully equipped military force custom-made for the Republic. It established itself virtually overnight, and in less than a week, the Republic went from debating whether it should create a unified Republic military to waging galactic-scale war with one of the most effective military forces the galaxy had ever seen. What's more, the GAR came fully equipped with its own arsenal, just waiting for the Republic to make use of it. In this video, we'll be doing a complete analysis of every part of that arsenal, from clone armor to ATTEs. Attention, Sergeant on deck! We all know that, contrary to appearances, the GAR didn't come out of nowhere. It was the product of a full decade of secret projects, a far-reaching conspiracy that stretched from the clone factories of Kamino to Coruscant and Sereno, where the galaxy's secret Sith Lords funneled personal wealth and embezzled Republic tax credits into the project. The Kaminoans kept the whole project meticulously ordered, and as part of that, they designed not only the clones themselves, but also the structures and arsenal of the Grand Army. The Kalmanoans understood that they were not just being contracted to clone a bunch of soldiers, they were being contracted to build an army, and an army consists of equipment, supply chains and command structures, as well as soldiers. They micromanaged the development of the army at every level, ensuring that the whole machine fit together smoothly. As we've discussed in the past, they designed everything related to the Grand Army to fit together according to flexible but predetermined patterns. The clones were raised in birth cohorts that would later become their platoons. The equipment was all designed to work together, and the basic battle strategies clone commandos were taught were specifically engineered to make the most of the Grand Army's arsenal. That's something to keep in mind as we go forward. We're about to go through a long list of equipment, much of it created specifically for the Grand Army's purposes, and as we do, we invite you to keep in mind how all these pieces of gear complement each other and work together to form the larger whole of the GAR. Much as the clones were taught to see themselves as pieces of a whole person, the equipment of the GAR is best understood when you look at it as the Kaminoans did, as cogs in a machine, pieces of a larger product. Most of the equipment used by the GAR were products of a small selection of companies, an obvious consequence of the project's secrecy. The first of these firms was the Kaminoan Armorsmiths, a company based on Kamino that produced, among other things, the iconic armor used by clone troopers. The Armorsmiths didn't work alone, however, even on the gear they produced themselves. Phase 1 clone armor took heavy inspiration from Mandalorian armor, and it was developed in consultation with Jango Fett and the Mandalorian members of the Koival Dar, the mercenaries Fett brought in to train the clone commandos. The Kaminoan armorsmiths analyzed Fett's own armor and used it as a basis for the armor they issued to the clones. Nonetheless, clone armor wasn't straight up Mandalorian and the Kaminoans instilled it with their own sensibilities as well. Like many Kaminoan products, it was made of plastoid, a lighter and more readily available substance than Beskar or Durasteel, and though it appeared bright white to the humans that wore it, it was covered in patterns only visible to those who could see ultraviolet light, much like the Kaminoan cities were. The Kaminoan armorsmiths had a division of weaponsmiths, but they subcontracted the development of most of the Grand Army's infantry weapons to Blastek Industries. Blastek was one of the galaxy's three big arms dealers, and the Kaminoans got them to develop several exclusive lines of high-powered blasters and other weapons for the Grand Army. In a select few cases, the Grand Army was equipped with standard-issue munitions obtained from one of Blastek's rivals, Merson munitions, but these were obtained on the market rather than specifically subcontracted. Finally, the Kaminoans subcontracted Kuat Drive Yards, and in particular, its secret subsidiary, Rathana Heavy Engineering, to build the Grand Army's arsenal of vehicles. RHE was based on Rathana, a remote planet whose location was known only to members of the subsidiary and the executives at KDY, making it ideal for the development of vehicles for the secret army. Rathana had allowed KDY to develop new vehicles in complete secrecy in the past, and it served the Kaminoans well in the same capacity. 
A few spaces from that corner of the outer rim told stories about seeing powerful brand new war machines being tested on remote backwaters in those days, but the rumors never spread far and were rarely taken seriously. So RHE was able to keep the project under wraps. After the start of the Clone Wars, the Republic contracted a few other manufacturers to help in making new vehicles, vessels and equipment for the Grand Army. Most notably, this included Rendili Star Drive, which collaborated with KDY on the Victor Initiative, which produced the first Star Destroyers. But for the most part, the Republic stuck to the same pool of manufacturers since, by and large, the gear the Kaminoans had commissioned worked perfectly and only needed to be tweaked or, in the case of the GAR's vehicle arsenal, supplemented. With all that business out of the way, let's talk about the first and most fundamental part of the clone kit, the armor. Clone armor was by and far the most recognizable symbol of the Grand Army of the Republic. Hell, it's one of the most recognizable symbols of Star Wars 2. There were several variants of clone trooper armor, all of which could be modified in various ways. We're going to go over the standard editions of each kit first and talk about the modifications second and we'll start with the original set of clone armor, phase 1. Every variation of clone armor included a black body glove, which covered the entirety of the wearer's body from the neck down. In conjunction with a helmet, this body glove could be vacuum sealed, pressurized and fully insulated. Even when not sealed, it worked in conjunction with the armor's temperature control units to keep the wearer at a comfortable temperature. The body glove was also protective to an extent as it helped insulate the wearer against skin contact poisons, extreme heat, or extreme cold. Even when pierced, it had utility as it could act as a compression sleeve to stem bleeding. The body glove was fitted with a series of magnetomic grip panels that the suit's armor plates were attached to. All told, Phase 1 clone armor consisted of 20 plates, not counting the helmet or placard, made of a lightweight but resilient plastoid alloy which together weighed just under 40 kilograms or 88 pounds, all told. Many of these plates were solely protective and had no additional functionality. This included the greaves and the thigh plates, which protected the wearer's legs, the gauntlet plates, which protected their hands, the rara braces, which protected their upper arms, the shoulder bells, which protected their shoulders, and the codpiece, which protected the wearer's crotch. These plates were all solid plastoid alloy and were inflexible but protective. The armor's elbow plates and knee plates were also solely protective, but these were specially reinforced with layers of armor plate to protect against particularly debilitating injuries. Other parts of the armor had additional features built into them. Clone armor came with a pair of high traction boots, which were counted among the 20 armor plates. These were designed to allow the wearer to get the best possible grip on any surface, and they could even be magnetized for use in low gravity situations. The armor's vambrances not only protected the wearer's forearms, but also featured parts of the armor's comlink systems. Clone troopers could use buttons built into the vambraces to switch between comms channels, and these control interfaces were likely also how they tweaked the temperature settings of their suits, among other things. Finally, there was the cuirass, which protected the wearer's upper body. The Phase 1 cuirass was considerably denser than the other pieces of the armor, especially the part that protected the wearer's chest, making it much harder to pierce. The back of the cuirass, meanwhile, contained the armor's climate control systems. The cuirass was the heaviest part of the whole kit, but its added density saved many troopers' lives, absorbing energy from blaster shots that would otherwise have killed them. Speaking of, let's talk about the actual utility of clone armor for a second. Clone trooper armor, as well as stormtrooper armor, gets a bad rap for seemingly being useless by which people typically mean that it doesn't provide perfect protection against blaster fire. But while it's true that sufficiently powerful blaster shots could burn clean through clone armor, fully blaster resistant armor would have been prohibitively expensive, and blaster bolts were only one of a hundred dangers a clone trooper could expect to encounter on the battlefield. They also had to reckon with shrapnel, environmental dangers, heat from fire and explosions, concussive force from explosions, fumes, and so much more. The main function of clone armor was to protect against all these secondary dangers to allow the wearer to focus on combat, and to that end, it worked quite well. Clone armor was completely resistant to temperature extremes, corrosives, toxic substances, shrapnel, bullets and other projectiles, and even vibroblades. 
The molecular makeup of the armor allowed troopers to pass through most kinds of deflector shields without injury. It provided moderate protection against radiation, and yes, it protected against blaster fire to a degree as well. Clone armor could stand up to glancing blaster bolts or shots from low-powered holdout blasters, and even when blaster bolts punched through the armor, the plastoid plating and the body glove beneath absorbed a good chunk of the energy from the blast, greatly decreasing the amount of damage the bolt could do to the wearer. All of this made a massive difference in combat, saving the lives of many wounded clones and making them more effective by rendering many distractions non-factors. In the real world, more people are killed by shrapnel on modern battlefields than they are by bullets. For clone troopers, neither shrapnel nor bullets posed much of a threat. Now back to the equipment. Apart from the armor itself, the standard Phase 1 kit came with a placard worn over the abdomen which wasn't counted among the 20 armor plates and appeared to be more flexible than the solid plastoid components of the suit. Phase 1 armor also included a utility belt, the contents of which we're going to discuss later. The final component of Phase 1 armor, and by far the most important component, was the helmet. The Phase 1 helmet was packed full of features. Obviously, it provided protection, but it also featured a tinted visor that protected the wearer against blinding flashes, and filters that allowed the wearer to breathe even in polluted or toxic environments, and an advanced electronics heads-up display. The HUDs of clone helmets were very advanced and controlled via eye movement. These allowed troopers to see through smoke and fog, to quickly identify fellow troopers and designated hostiles, and to access a wealth of sensor data about their environment. Clone helmets could even interface with standard issue Republic blasters, projecting crosshairs onto troopers' HUDs to make aiming considerably easier. Many troopers joked they were just lever arms that allowed their helmets to pull the triggers of their blasters, and while this was hyperbole, it wasn't all that far off much of the time. The helmet also contained the bulk of the armor's communications gear, featuring a comlink built into the helmet's chin, a pair of receivers over the years, and a high-powered transmitter built into the Phase 1 helmet's distinctive fin. This internal communications gear was soundproof, and it not only allowed clones to keep in touch with their squadmates in the heat of battle, but also kept clones in contact with local LAAT gunships and forward command centers. All told, Phase 1 armor was not only comprehensively protective, but also packed full of utility. With that said, it wasn't perfect, and it had enough flaws that it was eventually phased out. The biggest flaw with Phase 1 was that it was a pain in the ass, literally. Phase 1 armor was not all that ergonomic, and in particular, it was extremely uncomfortable to sit in. This was an especially big problem for clone pilots, who probably made the Republic's chiropractors very wealthy before they were eventually given lighter, more specialized armor. Phase 1 armor was also quite heavy, which made its subpar ergonomics an even bigger problem. All this earned the Phase 1 the nickname of Body Bucket. Fortunately for the clones though, the Kaminoan Armorsmiths did eventually take their feedback into account, and most of the problems with Phase 1 armor were rectified with Phase 2 armor. At a glance, the Phase 2 armor might look identical to Phase 1 armor apart from the helmet. Both kits were even made of the same basic components. Phase 2 armor still had the body glove, the 20 plates, the placard, the belt, and the helmet. But in reality, Everything except the body glove, the belt, and possibly the placard was tweaked in some way between generations. Every single plate of armor was redesigned to be far lighter and much more ergonomic than their original equivalents had been, and this not only made the armor much more comfortable to wear, but also easier to maneuver in. This did come at the cost of protection, however. The armor was made lighter by making it less dense and thus able to absorb less energy from blaster fire. But while Phase 2 armor didn't protect against blaster fire as much as Phase 1 armor, it stood up fine to just about everything else, and most clones considered the trade-off worth it, especially since the added maneuverability meant they got shot less. Phase 2 armor also incorporated a bunch of new gadgets and tweaks. Phase 2 boots incorporated grav field alternators and improved magnetization to allow for better balance in unstable or zero gravity environments. The internal comm system was generally improved, incorporating a better enunciator into the helmet to make speech more comprehensible. The transmitter fin was also made more compact. The Phase 2 set wasn't as effectively pressurized as its predecessor, 
but the new external respirator is meant to be hooked up to the new helmet's chin ports meant that this wasn't much of a problem and the helmet's air filtration and oxygen supply systems were greatly improved across the board. Phase 2 armor was also made easier for clones to customize with attachments formerly reserved for ARC troopers and top commanders. The biggest changes, of course, came with the helmet. Most of the helmet's features were the same, with one major addition. The Phase 2 helmet featured a pair of attachment points for hoses meant to be hooked up to an external oxygen supply. This, coupled with clone armor's pre-existing ability to be sealed against vacuum, allowed clones in Phase 2 armor to survive in outer space for short periods of time. This wasn't the only change made to the Phase 2 helmet, of course. We already mentioned the improvements to the comms systems, and the helmet's visor was tweaked as well, given better polarization and a new shape that supposedly gave troopers better peripheral vision. The Phase 2 helmet also came in a number of variants, including the Bark Trooper helmet, which had a more streamlined visor design, and the Clone Paratrooper helmet. For the most part, Phase 2 armor was an improvement over Phase 1, but there were trade-offs involved, and there was a minority of clones that thought they weren't worth it. A select few clones continued to use Phase 1 armor after the introduction of the Phase 2 kit. Captain Rex, meanwhile, decided that he wanted the best of both worlds, and when he was issued his new Phase 2 armor, he took a blowtorch to it, incorporating pieces of his old Phase 1 kit into it. Rex kept most of his Phase 2 armor, but he incorporated his Phase 1 cuirass and visor into it. In the latter case, Rex apparently preferred the older HUD and found that the Phase 1 visor gave him a better field of view. In the former case, he preferred the added protection of the Phase 1 cuirass, which makes sense, seeing as it saved his life when he was shot by a sniper on Seleucomai. Now we get to the variants of clone armor, beginning with the varieties issued to the Republic's elite soldiers. Arc Trooper Armor and Catan Class Commando Armor. There were three main varieties of Arc Trooper Armor. Two of them were just enhanced variants of the Phase 1 and Phase 2 kits, modified for added maneuverability and better protection, and given more attachment points for gadgets and additional equipment. Some variants of both kits included added layers of armor built into the boots, greaves, cuirass, and gauntlets. The third variant was a sort of Phase 1.5 kit that appeared in mid-21 BBY, around the time of the defense of Kamino. This variant of Arc Trooper armor appeared to be a prototype for Phase 2 armor, incorporating the new armor's visor and air nozzles, but the Phase 1 fin and comms system. The Catan class armor worn by clone commandos, on the other hand, was more interesting. The Kamino and Armorsmiths apparently spared no expense on this kit, which was several leagues better than standard clone armor in virtually every way. The body glove over which the suit was assembled was tougher, and the armor itself was thicker, made of blast-resistant duraplast instead of plastoid. This made Catan armor much more protective than standard clone armor, and it only got tougher as the war went on. The original Catan kit was replaced with the Catan Mark II, which provided additional protection against EMP weapons and Verpine shatter guns. This was replaced in turn by the Catan Mark III, which was almost completely blast resistant and could protect the wearer against grenades. These were the only real changes made between generations though. Like the standard clone kit, Catan class armor was composed of 20 pieces, a flexible placard, boots, and a helmet. The boots were rated for all manner of terrain, and the knuckle plate featured a hidden vibroblade for close encounters. All told, the kit weighed 20 kilograms, and it was worth 100,000 credits on the black market. It came with a heavy-duty survival pack, which was heavily customizable, but generally contained plenty of spare armor, explosives, emergency medical supplies, provisions and survival gear, an oxygen tank for operations in a vacuum, and even a portable communications array. It also contained a personal shield generator, which generated personal deflector shields around commandos that allowed them to take a few hits before they started suffering injuries. The helmet of the Catan suit featured full communication systems, an air filter, a heads-up display in the visor, a night vision mode, built-in electro binoculars, and a tactical spot lamp. Members of a squad synchronized their helmets, allowing their HUDs to display each other's vitals, enabling commandos to be able to tell when one of their brethren needed help. Like with standard clone helmets, the HUDs of Catan class helmets interfaced with the targeting systems of standard issue blasters, but Catan helmets had the unique ability to independently analyze and calculate targeting information for non-standard weapons, 
allowing it to generate specialized targeting reticules. Catan class armor was the most advanced variant of armor produced for the Grand Army of the Republic, but there were still other, more specialized kits that saw use over the course of the war, typically given to clones in variant roles such as pilots and ARF troopers. There were also armor variants made for specific climates. Let's start by talking about ARF trooper armor. This equipment was originally made solely for ARF troopers and ATRT drivers, but in many battles of the war, it was issued to ordinary troopers as well, as it was more suitable for certain environments than standard clone armor. The Phase 1 version of ARF Trooper armor was essentially just a slightly larger version of Phase 1 armor with a different helmet. These helmets contained a wealth of additional sensors, including infrared sensors and a lifeform scanner, and they also featured improved and more secure comlinks and visors to shield against sun glare. The Phase 2 version of ARF armor, also known as Reconnaissance armor, was much different. It incorporated fewer plastoid plates than standard Phase 2 armor, ditching the standard armor thigh plates and gauntlet plates and incorporating lighter, more flexible van braces. The armor's cuirass and placard were fused and designed differently from standard Phase 2 armor, with the design being much more flexible overall. Phase 2 ARF armor came with a thicker body glove with additional pouches for equipment, as well as an improved utility belt with additional pouches. Phase 2 ARF armor also included an improved version of the Phase 1 ARF trooper helmet. This helmet came in several variants, including one used by ATRT drivers. Another specialized version of this standard kit was given to Special Operations clone troopers. Only the Phase 1 configuration of this suit was ever seen, and like with ARF Trooper armor, it mostly resembled standard Phase 1 armor apart from the helmet. Spec Ops armor was painted black, and it's possible that it incorporated some kind of sensor dampening stealth technology. The main feature of Spec Ops armor was the helmet, however, which came with large earpieces that amplified small sounds for the trooper's environment, broadening their perceptions. Some clone armor variants were designed for specific climates. Clone Flame Troopers wore MK2 Hotspot insulated armor, which kept them protected from even the greatest extremes of heat. This armor bore virtually no resemblance to standard clone armor, consisting mostly of an insulated bodysuit with additional armor in the form of boots, greaves, knee plates, shoulder bells, a cuirass, a codpiece, gauntlet plates, and van braces. The cuirass was of a unique design and seemed to be somewhat flexible, and the helmet of this armor variant incorporated many flexible sections shielded by a rigid neck guard, as well as an improved fair filtration system. Hotspot armor also came with a built-in kama, which was usually a customizable add-on. The armor worn by Cold Assault Troopers, identified as HT-77 Cold Assault Armor in canon, was virtually identical to Hotspot armor, and it presumably functioned in more or less the same way, except it insulated against extreme cold instead of extreme heat. With the advent of Phase 2 armor, however, Cold Assault armor was replaced by first generation Snow Trooper armor. This kit seemed to be built around the thicker body glove over the Phase 2 ARF Trooper armor, but with most of its armor plates from the standard Phase 2 kit. Clone Snow Trooper armor lacked thigh plates and a codpiece, and it incorporated an improved variant of the unique cuirass used in Cold Assault armor, as well as the improved utility belts of Phase 2 ARF armor. Like Cold Assault and Hotspot armor, Clone Snow Trooper armor also included a kama as part of the standard kit to make up for the lack of thigh plates. It also included a pauldron, another piece of clone equipment that was usually a customizable add-on. The helmet of Clone Snow Trooper armor closely resembled that worn by future Imperial Snow Troopers, with a long, flexible breather hood over the faceplate and built-in snow goggles. Of course, it also came with more powerful heating units than standard clone armor. There was also clone dive armor, which was worn by scuba troopers and other clones operating underwater. This armor had a few variants, each built for a different depth, but they all operated in roughly the same, protecting the trooper from high pressure undersea environments and assisting them in underwater operations. The armor itself was apparently flexible in places and was streamlined for underwater operations, while the body glove beneath was thicker, pressure resistant, and of course, waterproof. The boots of clone dive armor came with flippers, and suits of this armor typically came with large backpacks, which contained reserve supplies of air, and sometimes jet boosters for underwater propulsion. 
The armor worn by clone gunners was mostly identical to the standard Phase 1 and Phase 2 sets, but it featured heavy durasteel plates for added protection on the shoulders and chest, which were meant to provide protection against kickback and explosions. The helmets of clone gunners were also provided with additional layers of armor and insulation, with the latter intended to prevent concussions or trauma from kickback, as well as enhanced sound dampening equipment. Lastly, we have the many variations of clone pilot armor. As we mentioned earlier, clone pilots originally wore slightly modified suits of phase 1 armor, which caused extensive discomfort when pilots were in the cockpit for long periods. This armor was modified to be able to mount life support systems and an emergency oxygen supply to the pilot's chest, the latter of which was connected to the helmet by a pair of hoses. Clone pilot helmets were slightly modified from the standard phase 1 design. They lacked their helmet fin present on most phase 1 armors, and they seem to have larger earpieces as well, possibly to help muffle the sound of particularly loud engines when operating in atmosphere. After the switch to Phase 2 armor, pilots were initially issued new suits that, like the original variant of pilot armor, was mostly identical to the standard Phase 2 kit, with a modified helmet and chest-mounted life support systems. However, later in the war, an alternative variant of Phase 2 clone pilot armor was issued and by the end of the war, the original Phase 2 pilot armor was all but phased out in favor of it. This new Phase 2 variant ditched most of the armor and even ditched the full face helmet in favor of more conventional pilot gear, which makes sense. Clone armor isn't terribly useful in the cockpit, and it seems like it would be more of a restriction than anything. Instead of a body glove, this armor set was built over a standard flight suit, which was sealable, reinforced as a precaution against crashes, and both more flexible and more comfortable than armor. Over this flight suit, pilots wore armored boots, gloves, and a harness, the latter of which had life support systems and a reserve air supply built into it. This variant of the Phase 2 pilot uniform came with two kinds of helmets, a closed-faced version for use in craft without an onboard life support, and an open-faced version for craft that did have life support. The latter provided better visibility, but pilots wearing it pretty much had no chance of survival if they had to eject during missions in space. Everything we've covered so far has been standard issue, but as you all surely know, clone armor was regularly customized by its wearers, and we'd like to talk about common modifications as well. The first and most basic way sets of clone armor were modified was with paint. As we mentioned earlier, clone armor was painted in a number of colors in the ultraviolet spectrum, but it appeared stark white to human eyes, which was both fairly bland and also not terribly practical in environments where bright white armor stood out like a sore thumb. With that said, while some clone armor sets, especially scout and aft armors, were painted with camouflage, this wasn't actually all that common. For the most part, the clones lived by an old Mandalorian adage about camouflage, which roughly translates to, it's one thing for them to see us coming, it's another thing for them to do something about it. Most paint jobs were instead meant to serve as unit or rank identifiers. During the early era of Phase 1 armor, clones with officer ranks had standardized painted stripes in their armor that indicated what rank they were. Sergeants had olive stripes, lieutenants had cyan stripes, captains had red stripes, and commanders had yellow stripes. But this system fell out of use as the war went on. Some clone officers, such as Commander Bly, continued to use their rank colors even on their Phase 2 armor, but for the most part, rank stripes were ditched within a year of the Battle of Geonosis. Clones started decorating their armor with colors that corresponded to their units, and this became standard practice after the issuance of Phase 2 armor. Most major units had their own standard patterns and colors. The 501st had blue stripes, the 212th had orange, the Coruscant Guard wore red, and so on. Some clones also painted symbols, kill marks, or even slogans on their armor. Commander Pons, for example, had the only good droid is a dead droid scrawled across the back of his helmet. There were also a lot of more substantial modifications that could be made to clone armor. At first, many of these modifications were reserved for ARC troopers and then clone commanders, but as the war went on, they became more readily available. One of the benefits of Phase 2 armor was that it was much more customizable than Phase 1, with more attachment points for additional equipment. Nonetheless, both Phase 1 and Phase 2 armor was customized with roughly the same sorts of gear. Helmet attachments were the most common. Common examples included simple visors that helped shield the eyes from sun glare, small spot lamps that could be attached to the side of the helmet for operation in dark areas, 
additional antennae that could be wired into the helmet for more secure communications, built-in electrobinoculars that fit over the helmet's visor and could be flipped up when not in use, and rangefinders that assisted in tracking and targeting. The latter modification came in two variants. The more common was side-mounted and antenna-like, which had to be flipped down in front of the visor to be used. There was also a rarer version of the rangefinder that was built directly into the visor. This variant was used by Alpha 17. Some of these pieces of equipment were modular and could easily be added or removed to clone helmets using a set of attachment points over the years. These included the first variant of rangefinder, the spot lamps, and the electrobinoculars, all of which were sometimes issued to ordinary troopers as they eliminated the need to carry handheld flashlights or electrobinoculars. A few other extra pieces of equipment required standard issue armor to be modified to accommodate them. Most of these were restricted to ARC troopers and were built into the bulkier gauntlets that the ARCs were issued. These extra gadgets included built-in hollow projectors, grappling hooks, flamethrowers, dart launchers, tasers, and even miniature rocket launchers. Most of the equipment in this category was based on the gadgets often incorporated into Mandalorian shock trooper armor, and it gave ARC troopers a few extra tricks to use in tricky situations. Most of the remaining armor mods were add-ons. Bandoliers, extra ammo belts, and straps were the most basic of these, and it's honestly arguable whether they count as an armor mod instead of just an extra piece of equipment. Extra armor plating, antennas, and equipment pouches were sometimes grafted onto standard armor. More substantial add-ons included karmas, pauldrons, and jetpacks, all of which were originally reserved for ARC troopers or specialized regs before being made available to officers and later the whole Grand Army. The Karma was a flexible, blast-dampening leather skirt that could be attached to troopers' utility belts. This was something the Grand Army had inherited from the Mandalorians, who themselves had actually adopted Karmas from the Surisian Sun Guard. These skirts theoretically gave the wearer extra leg protection, and the ones worn by clones could absorb energy to an extent, but for the most part, the Karma was a ceremonial piece of equipment, worn just for show or to honor the army's Mandalorian heritage. Its one main practical use was that it protected against heat and downblast from jetpacks, which meant that clones who wore jetpacks often wore karmas as well. Pauldrons were a bit more practical. These were made out of thicker material that was much more effective at stopping blast bolts, and they provided extra protection around the chest area. Clone pauldrons came in a bunch of different varieties, with different levels of protection and customizability. Phase 1 pauldrons were hemispherical and somewhat lopsided, extending further over the left shoulder than the right. This version of the pauldron was reserved for ARC troopers and ARC trained clone commanders, and the leftmost section of it was usually painted to match the wearer's rank or unit colors. The Phase 2 edition of the pauldron came in three variants. The first was small and unadorned, and it was available for any trooper to add to their kit. The second featured an added armor plate over the left shoulder, painted in unit colors, and was reserved for officers and veterans, and the third had an added plate over either shoulder, both in unit colors, and was reserved for ARC troopers. Ammo bandoliers and pouches for extra blaster rifle cartridges could be affixed to all variants of the pauldron. Finally, we have jetpacks. These were typically issued on a mission-by-mission -mission basis, but some clone officers and ARC troopers chose to make jetpacks a permanent part of their equipment set. The back of the cuirass in both Phase 1 and Phase 2 armor featured attachment rails for jetpacks, of which the GAR issued two variants. One was smaller, teardrop shaped, and probably only good for a handful of quick escapes, while the other was the Merson Munitions JT-12, which was the more versatile and better suited to dedicated airborne missions. We know little about the smaller variant, apart from that Commander Cody wore one as part of his Phase 2 uniform. The JT-12, meanwhile, was one of the galaxy's more popular jetpack models, and we know a fair bit more about it. It was designed for speed and maneuverability during flight, capable of propelling a clone trooper at speeds of up to 145 km per hour. The JT-12 had enough fuel for a full minute of continuous operations, or, if used as recommended, 23 second blasts, each of which could propel the wearer 100 meters horizontally or 70 meters vertically. Some GAR-issued JT-12s came with extra fuel tanks for longer use and or retractable wings for better maneuvering. The JT-12 also featured a built-in missile launcher designed for a single MM9 concussion rocket. 
That just about wraps up our look at clone armor and its many possible modifications. But the armor was only part of the Republic arsenal. Clone troopers were issued all manner of equipment for their missions, from standard issue supplies to mission specific high explosives. We're going to go through all of that now, starting by examining the contents of the standard clone utility belt. Every set of clone armor came with the utility belt. Some were modified, equipped with additional pouches to store more equipment in, but we're only going to be talking about the standard issue belt today. The various pouches of the standard issue clone utility belt included extra power packs and gas cartridges for blasters, an ascension cable that could be attached to the DC-15A blaster rifle or used as a handheld device, at least one meal's worth of rations, and a basic medical kit containing Bacta and synth flesh. Though neither of these was standard issue, nearly all clones also carried multi-tools and sanitary wipes in their belts as well. Clone utility belts also featured built-in transponders and they had a single Blastec N20 Beradium core thermal detonator strapped to the back, meant to be used as a weapon of a last resort. When activated, these weapons would unleash a miniature nuclear explosion that would vaporize anything within 5 meters. When needed, clones also made use of simple armored GAR issued backpacks, which could carry more ammunition, additional medical supplies, or grenades. Clones had a wide variety of grenades to choose from, most of them widely available pieces of equipment that the Kaminoans bought on the open market. These included Merson V1 and Class A thermal detonators, and Sorosub LXR6 anti-vehicle concussion grenades, as well as at least three varieties of EMP grenades, including the Merson V6 Haywire grenade, which clone troopers lovingly nicknamed droid poppers. For extended missions, clones usually brought along two thermal detonators, two concussion grenades, and a droid popper. The GAR also had a number of more exotic explosives that saw more limited use. These were usually issued only to commandos, ARC troopers, and clones with extra training. These included frag grenades, which unleashed clouds of shrapnel upon exploding, and ion grenades, which unleashed a blast of iron energy which destroyed electronic equipment. ARC troopers were known to use reverse polarity pulse grenades, which were essentially more powerful EMP grenades with a larger radius. These were rarely used by non-ARCs, since they shorted out the electronics in clone armor as well as the enemy droids. Connor Ship Systems HX-2 anti-personnel mines were occasionally used by ARC troopers and heavy weapons troopers for area denial, while standard detonation packs, ribbon chargers, and thermal detonated tape were used as fixed explosives that could be applied to target structures or vehicles. And now to the fun part, the guns. Blast Tech produced a whole arsenal of custom, heavy-duty blasters for the GAR's exclusive use, all of which were more powerful than standard blaster weaponry. Since the Grand Army was up against battle droids most of the time, gas cartridges meant for use in Republic issue blasters were usually filled with a special blaster gas variety that was extra ionized. This produced blue-tinted blaster bolts that were especially effective against droids or electronic systems. The GAR's primary standard issue blaster weapons were the DC-15A blaster rifle and the DC-15S blaster carbine. Let's start with the 15A. The DC-15A was large and bulky even for a blaster rifle, but it made up for its awkwardness with power and accuracy. It weighed 9.5 pounds and was as long as some humans were tall. It featured a large weighted stock to balance the otherwise front heavy weapon cooling fins on the barrel to radiate waste heat, an attachment point for grappling hooks or flashlights, as well as a set of iron sights and an optical telescopic scope that could be used if a trooper's HUD was offline for whatever reason. When not in use, the scope was stored on the underside of the weapon where it could double as a hand rest. Most of the time, however, troopers using DC-15As synced the weapon's electronic rangefinders with their HUDs which allowed clones to receive targeting information directly from their blasters. The DC-15A could fire off 50 shots per power pack and 500 shots per Tabana gas cartridge or 300 shots on maximum power. Reloading the power pack was quick and easy. The spent pack could be ejected with the push of a button, allowing for a new one to be slid back in. Reloading the gas cartridge was much more involved and it required snapping the whole rifle open. The DC-15A had a variety of power settings, including stun and high power modes, but even in standard fire, 
Each round from these rifles was extremely powerful, able to punch through even the toughest armor and blast a half meter crater in solid ferrocrete. The 15A was far more powerful than nearly any other blaster rifle and it had an extremely long range too. When mounted on a tripod, it was accurate at ranges of up to 10 kilometers. The DC-15A could be used in both fully automatic and semi-automatic modes, though it wasn't considered a true repeating blaster, as it wasn't designed to pump out a constant stream of fire, and its accuracy suffered when it was used at full auto. All told, the DC-15A blast rifle was one of the most powerful non-repeating blast rifles ever designed, able to take down most opponents with a single shot. But it wasn't without its shortcomings. As aforementioned, it was heavy, long, and awkward to maneuver with, which made it unsuitable for use indoors, in narrow urban settings, or in other places where its awkwardness hindered its use. It was much better suited to open battlefields. The DC-15A was preferred for such engagements, as well as for engagements in which clone infantry expected to go up against dwarf spider droids or light vehicles, as these blaster rifles were powerful enough to be able to punch through their armor with relative ease. Then there was the DC-15S Blaster Carbine, the Grand Army's other standard issue blaster. The 15S was dramatically smaller and lighter than the 15A, making it much easier to carry around. It had roughly the same internal design as the 15A, but was much more compact. It was much lighter, much shorter, and in general, much easier to maneuver with, and it didn't have to sacrifice all that much power when compared to its larger cousin. Like the DC-15A, the DC-15S had cooling fins on its barrel to radiate waste heat, a stun setting, and a set of iron sights that allowed troopers to aim if their HUDs were offline. As with most Republic blasters, it was typically aimed using built-in electronic equipment that synced with troopers' helmets. The 15S lacked the added scope and high power mode of the 15A, and it had less long-range accuracy, but the latter problem was somewhat mitigated by the carbine's iconic folding stock, which, while usually folded beneath the barrel, could be extended out to increase the effective range of the weapon. The DC-15S had roughly the same ammunition capacity as its larger cousin, with its power packs lasting for 50 shots and its blaster gas cartridges lasting for 500 shots. The power pack was side-mounted and easily replaced, but replacing spent Tabana cartridges was difficult to the point that clones usually only did it in their spare time, and troopers that used the DC-15S rarely carried spare Tabana cartridges. Also like its larger cousin, the DC-15S could operate as both a semi-automatic or fully automatic weapon, though it was again not well suited to full auto. Unlike the 15A, the 15S only had two power settings, standard fire and stun, with its standard fire mode being less powerful than the DC-15As. Its range was also dramatically decreased from the larger rifles, However, the DC-15S made up for its decreased range and stopping power with versatility and a higher rate of fire, and it generally handled better in sustained firefights. The DC-15S could be held like a pistol or like a rifle. Some troopers, ARC troopers especially, carried it one-handed, even wielding two at once, while most used it two-handed. Originally, the DC-15A was supposed to be the Grand Army's primary weapon, while the DC-15S was meant as a backup weapon to be used in circumstances where the DC-15A would be too large and unwieldy. Over the course of the Clone Wars, however, the roles steadily reversed, with the DC-15S becoming the more widely used weapon and the DC-15A seeing action only in specialty situations it was better suited to. In a sense, the DC-15A could be considered equivalent to Phase 1 clone armor, while the DC-15S was more similar to Phase 2 armor. Like Phase 1 armor, the 15A was bulkier but more effective, while the 15S and Phase 2 gear sacrificed some of that effectiveness for added versatility. Obviously, both blast weapons were used concurrently throughout the war, but the parallel is interesting nonetheless. Moving on, let's talk about sidearms. The Grand Army of the Republic had two, the DC-17 Hand Blaster and the DC-15S Blaster Pistol. The DC-17 is the one you're probably familiar with. It was a compact heavy blaster pistol, sometimes classified as a commando pistol, and much like many popular armor mods, it was originally reserved for the use of ARC troopers and clone officers. These blasters were pretty small despite their classification as heavy pistols, 
but this was deceptive. The DC-17 was a devastating weapon with high stopping power. It was actually more powerful than the DC-15S carbine and it also had a higher rate of fire and less recoil. These heavy blasters were extremely efficient weapons and due to their small size, many clone officers used two of them at once for added firepower. The DC-17 also had a stun setting and like other standard issue Republic weapons, it had electronic rangefinders that could sync with the HUDs in clone helmets. Of course, the DC-17 had its shortcomings too. Its small size meant that it had a much smaller ammo capacity and its blaster gas cartridges were only good for 50 shots, just a tenth of what its standard issue cousins were capable of. But the power and utility of the DC-17 made it a favorite among officers, arcs, and eventually the rest of the Grand Army. There were actually two variants of the DC-17. The standard version seen most prominently in Star Wars The Clone Wars, and a larger version with a much longer, possibly detachable barrel, which was most prominently used by the Ark Captain Fordo. Presumably, the longer barrel gave this variant of the DC-17 a longer effective range, though its greater length meant it would have been less reliable as a quick draw weapon. It's unknown if the two variants differed in other ways. There was also an alternate pistol issued exclusively to clone commandos, the DC-15S Sidearm Blaster. The DC-15S Sidearm, not to be confused with the DC-15S Carbine, was slightly larger than the D-17 Hand Blaster but not nearly as powerful. It had a fairly slow rate of fire, an optimal range of just 30 meters, and a maximum effective range of 120 meters. It was, however, lightweight, weighing just a kilogram, and it was a good last resort weapon in close quarters combat. Its big selling point, however, was its ammo capacity, or lack thereof. The power cells of the DC-15S naturally recharged themselves indefinitely, and the sidearm was either very good at conserving blast gas, or used some substitute that it could also regenerate. The specifics of how it worked aside, the DC-15S never ran out of ammo. It took one second for the weapon to recharge enough for one shot, and when fully charged, it could get seven shots off in a short burst before the wielder had to wait for it to charge up again. This made it invaluable to the clone commandos who carried it, as it meant they would always have a usable ranged weapon on hand, and they could rely on the DC-15S long after all their other weapons had run out of ammo. Sidearms aside, let's get back to talking about blaster rifles. We already discussed the two main standard issue rifles of the GAR, the DC-15A and the DC-15S, but there was a third DC rifle in the standard lineup, the DC-15X sniper rifle. As we mentioned earlier, the DC-15A was effective over extremely long ranges, but it wasn't a true long range precision rifle. That niche was filled by the DC-15X, which was loosely based on the DC-15A's design. The DC-15X had an even longer range and a much higher accuracy than its standard issue cousin, and it featured a more advanced scope which could work in conjunction with the clone's HUD or independently. It was also even more powerful than the DC-15A, allowing it to pulverize virtually any enemy from extreme range. However, the DC-15X was exclusively semi-automatic and it had a much smaller ammo capacity than the DC-15A with its cartridges good for only six shots. Strictly speaking, the DC-15X was part of the Grand Army's standard arsenal, but in practice, it was only really used by dedicated clone snipers and sometimes ARC troopers. Those were all the weapons used by your average clone trooper, but it was only the beginning of the GAR's full arsenal. There were three other blasters whose use was reserved to clones from special units, the DC-19, the DC-17M, and the Westar M5. Let's start with the DC-19 Stealth Carbine. These exotic and expensive weapons were only issued to clone Shadow Troopers, elite units who worked directly for the Director of Republic Intelligence, Armand Issard, for whom they carried out espionage, sabotage, and assassination missions deep in separatist space. The DC-19 was based on the DC-15S Blaster Carbine but it was modified with a number of stealth settings. Among these was a sound dampener that made blaster shots mostly inaudible. The most exotic feature of the DC-19, however, 
was that it was designed to use specially refined Tabana gas that, when fired, produced invisible blaster bolts. Thus, the DC-19 allowed Shadow Troopers to kill targets without making any noise or producing any visible blaster bolts from ranges of up to 450 meters. As you can imagine, this made the DC-19 extraordinarily useful for sniping and other stealth-based combat duties. The DC-19's benefits did come at a cost though, apart from the guns being very expensive. The DC-19 lacked a stun setting, its sound dampeners would burn out if the weapon was fired too quickly, and the cartridges of the exotic Tabana were only good for 10 shots each due to the instability of the gas. However, the DC-19 nonetheless served its purpose well, albeit only in the hands of these reclusive Republic intelligence operatives. A more well-known elite clone weapon was the DC-17M Interchangeable Weapons System, the primary weapon issued to all clone commandos. This was a Swiss army gun capable of functioning as a rapid-firing blaster rifle, a sniper rifle, or an anti-armor grenade launcher, the ultimate weapon of the Republic's commandos. Commandos could switch out the DC-17M's different attachments in a matter of seconds, a process that was as easy as reloading the weapon. Each attachment featured electronic rangefinders that linked up with Commando's helmet HUDs, and the ICWS featured a recoil dampening stock and an electronic counter indicating how many rounds the weapon had left. Most of its other features varied depending on configuration. When in standard configuration, the DC-17M functioned as a blaster rifle. It had a range of up to 450 meters and a very high rate of fire, higher than both the DC-15A and the DC-15S. Each shot wasn't terribly powerful, but the weapon's high rate of fire meant that it made up for this with sheer ducker. The blaster gas cartridge in a DC-17M was good for 300 shots, while the power packs were each good for 60 shots. A single 60 round clip could rapidly mow down a few squads of B1 battle droids, and though the DC-17M was far from the most powerful blaster rifle ever made, Clone Commandos found it reliable and undeniably effective. Sometimes though, the blaster configuration was insufficient for Commandos purposes, which was where the DC-17M's other firing modes came in. Swapping out the weapon's configuration was a simple matter of sliding off the upper front quarter of the gun, sliding on another attachment, and in most cases, switching out the weapon's power pack for another kind of ammunition cartridge. The most commonly used alternative configuration was the DC-17M's sniper mode. In this mode, the DC-17M was only semi-automatic, but much, much more precise, and with a much longer range. It had a set of electromagnetic targeting sights with two zoom modes, described lovingly by Clone Commando Sev as up close and personal, and hello you're dead, 10 times and 20 times respectively. DC-17M sniper shots were very powerful and capable of killing most opponents with one shot. Each power pack was good for only five shots, however. Another of the DC-17M's most popular configurations was the anti-armor mode, which transformed the weapon into a grenade launcher. Each grenade was loaded individually, with most commandos carrying four at a time. Each grenade had a four meter blast radius, and the grenade launcher had an effective range of several meters. The DC-17M's anti-armor mode was, in the wise words of the Clone Commando boss, great against fortified droids, armored vehicles, and anyone else with an inflated opinion of himself. As the Clone Wars went on, Republic procurement churned out a few more attachments for the DC-17M, starting with the PEP laser attachment. In this mode, the DC-17M fired non-lethal pulsed energy projectiles meant to stun targets into submission. It wasn't nearly as smooth an experience as getting hit with a standard stun blast though. The effect has been described as being simultaneously hit with a flashbang and shot in the chest with a series of plastoid rounds. By the sounds of it, the PEP attachment was supposed to be a sort of rubber bullet, where it was meant to be non-lethal but very much meant to hurt as a means of dissuasion. Though rubber bullets can still kill under certain conditions, and by the sounds of it, a PEP laser probably could too. Toward the end of the Clone Wars, Merson also released a DC-17M compatible breach charge attachment, which was like the anti-armor round, but with a longer range and meant for blowing up doors. The DC-17M might seem like the ultimate commando weapon, but it actually wasn't used all that much by the Republic's ARC troopers, despite them almost definitely having the clearance. Rather, 
Arctroopers favoured an even gnarlier model of blaster rifle, the Westar M5. These heavy blaster rifles were related to the blaster pistols used by clone progenitor Django Fett, though they looked absolutely nothing alike. The Westar M5 was a bulky but extraordinarily powerful blaster rifle, eclipsing even the considerable power of the DC-15A. At its highest power settings, it could punch through the armor of an armored assault tank, which is no small feat. The Westar M5 had full auto, semi-auto, and burst fire modes, and it featured hard points on the underside of the barrel, where a single shot pump action grenade launcher could be mounted, adding to the already incredible stopping power of this weapon. This monster of a gun did have one drawback though. Its peak range was only 250 meters, dramatically shorter than most other Republic issued blaster rifles. Nonetheless, the Westar M5 was a favorite of the Republic's ARC troopers, most notably Alpha 17. There was one final class of blasters that members of the GAR made extensive use of, heavy repeaters. These were only given out to clones with the appropriate heavy weapons training, and when used properly, they were devastatingly powerful, able to shred through whole platoons of B1 battle droids in a matter of minutes. There were two kinds of heavy repeating blasters used by the Grand Army of the Republic, and unlike most Republic weapons, they were both products of Merson munitions, not Blastec Industries. First up, we have by far the most well-known heavy repeater, the Z6 Rotary Blaster Cannon, which many of you likely know as the chosen weapon of Heavy and Commander Thorn. The Z6 was bulky and weighed 16 kilograms, and it required two hands to operate, making it somewhat awkward and difficult to use, especially since it had especially powerful recoil. It featured an assembly of six rapidly rotating barrels, each with its own articulating chamber, which were built around a coolant-lined core. Its efficient design gave it both a high rate of fire and good cooling, allowing it to be used constantly without much of a risk of overheating. The Z6 did have a set of iron sights and presumably could also interface with the HUDs of clone helmets, but it was best used as a spray and pray weapon since accuracy wasn't what it had been designed for anyway. The Z6 rotary cannon had an incredibly high rate of fire and it could spew out 166 powerful armor-piercing blaster bolts per minute or between two and three per second, spraying constant streams of fire across the battlefield. The Z6's power pack was only good for 200 shots, which meant it could only keep uninterrupted fire for a minute and change. But if used in short bursts, it could go much longer without the need for reloading. It could be attached to a power generator for longer continuous use, but this of course required the wielder to stay more or less in one place. The Z6 had a maximum range of 750 meters, though it was best used at ranges of up to 75 meters. This blaster was one of the Grand Army's most powerful blasters, second only to the other heavy repeater in the Republic arsenal. This beast of a weapon was the Experimental Reciprocating Quad Blaster, or SIPQUAD for short. Typically reserved for ARC troopers, the SIPQUAD was a huge portable quad laser featuring four double barrels linked to a massive backpack mounted power cell. These monsters were so huge that the power cell backpack featured built-in repulsor lifts as insurance against recoil. Most of the SIP quad specs are unknown, but it was extremely powerful, capable of destroying corporate alliance tanks or armored assault tanks. It was slow to maneuver due to its size, however, so it wasn't terribly effective against infantry, and was only usually deployed against slow or especially tough targets. The SIPQUAD's barrels could be fired one at a time or in pairs, and in either case, the SIPQUAD was truly a nasty weapon, if a tremendously cumbersome one. Apart from heavy repeaters, the GAR availed itself of a selection of rocket and grenade launchers which, like the heavy repeaters, were restricted to clones with heavy weapons training. Most of these were also MERS on products, like the Grand Army's heavy repeaters, and they were typically used against enemy vehicles, bunkers, or other hard targets. Popular model of rocket launcher used by the GAR was the Merson RPS-6. The RPS-6 was apparently more broadly available than most Republic weapons, since it was also used by the CIS and was acquired on the black market by the Onaka gang with apparent ease. The RPS was a simple, efficient shoulder-fired anti-vehicular rocket launcher with a magazine capable of holding six rockets at a time. 
It had electronic rangefinders that could link up to the HUD in a clone trooper's helmet for easy aiming, and it could fire both dumb fire and homing rockets. The RPS-6 was quite effective, able to destroy tanks and even lightly ray shielded vehicles with ease. It was also quite effective at smiting small groups of enemy infantry and light vehicles. All told, it got the job done quite well. Republic forces also made use of the Merson PLX-1 portable missile launcher, also known as the Plex, a larger and more powerful variety of rocket launcher. These bad boys were meant to be used against heavily armored vehicles or enemy emplacements, and not even the toughest armor could stand up to a Plex. The PLX-1 had sophisticated targeting systems with a maximum range of 40 kilometers, allowing this missile launcher to be used as a form of portable artillery. The launcher was shoulder fired and had enough magazine space for two rockets, which it fired via mass driver technology. The PLX-1 could fire two kinds of rockets, both of which were designed by Arakid Industries. The first was a simple dumb fire missile, while the other was a smart GAM or gravity activated missile. The latter missile variety locked onto gravity signatures instead of the more easily maskable heat signatures, allowing it to hit targets from extreme ranges. Both varieties of Plex missile had large detonite cores with massive explosive yields, and a single missile fired from one of these bad boys could crack an armored assault tank in half. All told, the PLX was a true heavy duty rocket launcher used by Republic forces in situations where the RPS-6 would be too lightweight. Republic forces occasionally used the Krupp's Munitions Minimag Shoulder Launch Proton Torpedo Launcher, which, as the name suggests, fired small proton torpedoes. It had the magazine capacity for seven dumbfire proton torpedoes. The Grand Army was also known to deploy mortars on occasion for long-range anti-infantry shelling. The specifications of the mortars used by the GAR are unknown, though the weapons can be assumed to be Republic issue and their only known use was in the Battle of Umbara, but they seemed fairly simple to operate and devastatingly effective at long ranges, as the men of the 212th Attack Battalion unfortunately learned firsthand. The GAR also issued several kinds of more unusual weapons, which we've saved for last. We're going to start out with the miscellaneous category by starting with the Republic's plasma disruptors and electrical weapons, both unusual weapons that were sometimes used due to their high utility against battle droids. Plasma disruptors, for those unaware, functioned somewhat like an ion blaster, except it was plasma based and thus effective against organics as well. These weapons were generally only effective at close-ish ranges, and the Grand Army of the Republic had two varieties that it occasionally issued to its troops. The first was the Phoenix II, manufactured by the Drevo Corporation, and it wasn't actually designed as a weapon. Rather, it was initially issued to customs agents, commandos, and sometimes clone pilots as a tool for opening locked doors. But it proved highly effective as an improvised weapon against battle droids, so Drevo modified the design to produce the DN Boltcaster, which was designed as a weapon and made for the exclusive use of the GAR. The DN Boltcaster had a slow rate of fire and had to be charged up to produce a suitably devastating energy bolt, but it was nonetheless highly destructive in the right circumstances. Both varieties of plasma disruptor were rarely seen. The Republic also made extensive use of the Mersun Electromagnetic Pulse Launcher, a rocket launcher-like weapon that was sometimes issued to jet troopers. The MP launcher fired spheres of ion energy that, upon contact with a solid object, would unleash a devastating electromagnetic pulse, burning out the circuits of all droids within a broad area of effect. This destructive weapon was known to cause B-1 battle droids to fly apart, as the pulse shorted out the electromagnets that held the droids' limbs together. All told, the EMP launcher was a devastatingly effective weapon against battle droids, but it had limited utility against organics, and this, combined with the weapon's unwieldiness, made it an uncommon sight on the battlefields of the Clone Wars. On rare occasions, specially trained clone flame troopers made use of Blastech X-42 flamethrowers, which worked, well, like flamethrowers. The BTX-42 was highly effective and used by a number of non-GAR factions, it saw little direct use in the Clone Wars, since flames were not terribly effective against battle droids, but when the GAR was up against organic opponents, such as the Geonosians, the BTX-42 was sometimes enlisted for clearing out enemy emplacements and the committing of war crimes, the Grand Army's favorite pastime. 
Most infamously, this model of flamethrower saw use in the Second Battle of Geonosis. Finally, though most clones were not equipped with melee weapons, they did see use from time to time. Unlike during the Jedi Civil War, when the widespread use of energy shields meant that shield-piercing vibro blades and vibro swords were issued alongside blasters to all Republic soldiers, personal melee weapons were considered unnecessary for frontline soldiers by the time of the Clone Wars, especially since many weren't all that effective against battle droids. Nonetheless, some clones, especially commandos or arc troopers, were known to carry vibro blades for various reasons. In fact, Katan class armor had a small retractable vibro blade built into the knuckle plate for close quarters combat. For the most part though, vibro blades and vibro swords were uncommon, only seeing use on planets like Drongar, where environmental conditions made blasters unusable, forcing the Republic and the Separatists to arm their soldiers primarily with bladed weapons. Some clones were also occasionally issued shields. For the most part, these were physical shields, not energy shields. Clone commandos had personal energy shields, but during the Clone Wars, the technology was too expensive for more widespread use. Instead, clone troopers in particularly sensitive firefights were sometimes given blast shields. Specifically, these were M3 bulwark blast shields, which were slabs of solid plasteel the size of a fully grown clone trooper. The M3 bulwark had a thin transparasteel slit near the top for its troopers to see through, allowing clones a degree of visibility when they took cover behind them. These shields were heavy, could shrug off blaster fire and shrapnel, and they could even absorb most of the concussive force from grenade blasts. All told, the M3 Bulwark, when deployed, kept its users safe from most battlefield dangers, albeit on one side only. These blast shields ultimately weren't used all that much, as they were heavy and cumbersome, but they were extremely useful in environments where cover was lacking and heavy resistance was to be expected, such as Ringo Vinda. M3 Bulwark Blast Shields were sometimes also planted into the ground for use as stationary cover around command points on open battlefields. Clones assigned to riot control duties were issued smaller, lighter shields that were likely made of less durable materials. Such clones were typically armed with stun batons, which were one of three melee weapons occasionally issued to troopers whose duties were expected to involve melee combat. Some troopers were armed with electro staffs, though not necessarily the lightsaber resistant kind used by IG-100 Magna Guards. Clone troopers assigned to the Lancer Battalion, meanwhile, carried Verpine Power Lancers. All of these melee weapons are self-explanatory, we think, so let's move on. By this point, we've covered every last bit of personal equipment the clones of the Grand Army of the Republic used, but we're not done. Because just as it takes more to make an army than a bunch of soldiers, there's more to the Republic arsenal than personal equipment. There's also stuff like advanced medical equipment, stationary guns, and, of course, armored vehicles that wouldn't have been issued to individual clones but would have been operated by or assigned to a whole squad or platoon. To begin, let's talk about stationary heavy repeating blasters. The archetype for this kind of blaster weapon is the E-Web, a variant of which, the EWHB-12, served as the Republic's main stationary heavy repeating blaster model during the Clone Wars. There were two variants of the EWHB-12 in service with the GAR, both of which were slightly larger and bulkier than the Imperial E-Webs famously employed at the Battle of Hoth a generation later, though they operated on the same general principle. The EWHB-12, which stands for Emplacement Weapon Heavy Blaster and was often colloquialized simply as E-Web, was meant to be manned by one or two troopers, and though it could be disassembled and transported by a single person, it weighed 38 kilograms and was thus only suitable for use when stationary. Its firepower also meant that the weapon had to be rigidly mounted or else it would quickly be knocked over by recoil. An E-Web could be set up in a minute's time by a trained crew, but it took a further 10 to 15 minutes for the weapon's power generator to charge up, so it was generally best for these weapons to be deployed in advance when possible. E-Webs stood on a set of manually adjustable stabilizer legs, atop which the main gun was mounted. The gun could rotate a full 360 degrees, and its barrel could be raised or lowered to an extent as well, giving it a wide field of fire. The gun itself was about 2 meters long, and it was designed for rapid fire. Computerized targeting systems were built into the back of the weapon, which was operated via a pair of control handles. The targeting systems included built-in rangefinders with infrared and night vision modes, and eWebs also had built-in encrypted comlinks meant to coordinate gunnery crews. 
The E-Web was powered by a dedicated X1 Class 43 power generator connected to the weapon by a flexible power cable. This generator was high yield and could power the blaster indefinitely, essentially providing it with unlimited ammunition. However, the generator was finicky and prone to overheating despite its powerful cooling units, and monitoring and adjusting the settings on the generator was pretty much a full-time job. Thus, in ideal situations, an E-Web would be manned by two troopers, one to actually use the weapon and another to make sure the power generator didn't blow up. An E-Web could be operated by a single trooper, but this greatly reduced efficiency since it meant the gunner had to either constantly pause to adjust the generator or resort to a safe power preset, which reduced the blaster's rate of fire, but was less likely to cause overheating. As we mentioned earlier, there were two EWHB-12 variants deployed by the GAR. The more common one, as seen in Star Wars The Clone Wars, was much bulkier and probably older than both the other variant and the later Imperial E-Web. It stood on four legs instead of the usual three, and the gun itself was larger. It also had a more complex and computerized targeting suite and a seemingly lower rate of fire. The other variant was smaller and lighter. It was tripod mounted, it had a stripped down barrel, and unlike all other known E-Webs, it had a seat for the gunner. It could be adjusted more easily, but it seemed to be less powerful than the other variant. In either case though, the EWHB-12 was a very powerful weapon. It could hit targets at ranges of up to 750 meters, its accuracy was pretty solid, and fired powerful bolts at a high rate. One of these guns could shred a whole platoon of battle droids and it could easily pierce the armor of some of the Separatists' heavier droid infantry or shoot down light vehicles. The EWHB-12 even had an auto fire mode which just goes to show that nearly all of the work necessary to operate one of these things involved babysitting the power generator. Generally speaking, the Republic almost always deployed EWHB-12s to defend friendly positions, but they were sometimes used offensively as well. During the Battle of Christosis, for example, Torrin Company attempted to use one as part of an ambush, setting one up in a tower to fire on a droid column that was passing by. Clone commandos were also known to find more aggressive uses for E-Webs. When requested, a single EWHB could be issued to a commando squad for missions, and single commandos rarely did anything defensively, so these weapons ended up finding some pretty creative uses in the hands of the Republic's elite. Despite its effectiveness, the EWHB-12 and the aforementioned Clone Mortar seem to have been the only crude weapons used by the Grand Army of the Republic, or at least the only crude weapons that were small enough to not be classifiable as vehicles. Thus, we're going to put Republic weapons aside for the time being and move on to an altogether different class of equipment, medical gear. For every clone to die on the battlefields of the Clone Wars, three were wounded, and it was essential for as many of them to be nursed back to health as possible. Every clone carried a basic first aid kit on them at all times, and clones trained to be battlefield medics typically carried larger ones, but a first aid kit can only do so much when there's a gaping hole in your chest. Stuff like stretchers, surgical gear, and antiseptic field generators were too cumbersome to be integrated into a clone medic's battlefield kit, so the Republic had to work out more complicated ways to get wounded clones the aid they needed. When a clone was wounded, vital signs monitors in their helmet, if they were still functional, would broadcast an alert tag to a location, which would be received by all local Republic Command terminals, gunships, and walkers, as well as by the troopers' squadmates. It would then be up to nearby clones to recover their fallen brother and get them to safety. As seen in Star Wars The Clone Wars, the Republic's speeder bikes could be equipped with stretchers to effectively ferry wounded clones out of harm's way. Failing that, other clones could haul them away themselves, or in some cases, an LAAT would swoop in to pick them up. In most cases, the fallen clones' comrades would try to get them to an ATTE, an LAAT gunship, or a dedicated Republic emplacement. There, there was always a medic that could take over, but most of the time, this medic wasn't a clone. Every ATTE and LAAT gunship carried a single Cybot Galactica IM-6 battlefield medical droid, and these units treated the vast majority of wounded clones that fell during the Clone Wars. These little guys were compact enough to be able to fit into storage lockers when not in use, with such lockers located on the nose section of the LAAT and the forward half of the main cabin of the ATTE. The IM-6 was highly advanced, 
Programmed with a wealth of medical data and techniques and equipped with heuristic processes that allowed the droids to learn new techniques from experience. The IM-6 was based on the design of the JN-66 analysis droid, another Cybot Galactica product, and its combat frame boasted a ton of useful features. It was packed with sensors that allowed the droid to quickly and easily determine the exact nature of any injury, and its hands were designed for precision, allowing it to perform complex and highly sensitive surgeries quickly and efficiently. On top of this, the droids were surprisingly strong, and one could use its repulsor lifts to drag a wounded clone to safety if the need arose. The IM-6's chasers contained a medpack reservoir and a full surgery kit, as well as supplies of anesthetics and other important drugs. IM-6s tended to have eager personalities, and they were given soothing voices to help calm wounded clones. Most also had a developed sense of compassion, leading them to prioritize pain relief when their patients were in clear agony. If an IM-6's equipment was insufficient to stabilize a clone's condition, the droids were also equipped with comlinks that allowed them to call for more dedicated medical assistance. The IM-6 moved by means of two powerful repulsor lifts which allowed them to zip across battlefields, dodging enemy fire to get to the wounded as soon as possible. All told, the IM-6 was one of the most sophisticated medical droids of the time, and the clones of the Grand Army quickly grew attached to them. To quote an outtake from the Essential Guide to Warfare, IM droids' effectiveness coupled with soldiers' natural bent towards superstition, led many Republic units to consider the droids members of their units, painting them in regimental colors and tapping their bodies for luck before deployment. But for all their sophistication and dedication to helping, IM-6s couldn't do everything. Many clones ended up needing more intensive care, and most of the time, they were shipped off to the RIMSUS, the Republic Mobile Surgical Units, or RMSUs for short. RIMSUS were small field hospitals designed according to a standard model for rapid fabrication on the battlefields of the Clone Wars, able to be set up or disassembled for transport in just an hour's time. In theory, they were equipped to stabilize all but the most devastating of wounds. Mobile surgical units were not only meant to be stocked with every drug and medical tool known to the Republic, but also with antiseptic fields, bacter tanks, and even small cloning tanks where replacement organs could be grown. Rimsus were also staffed with a full contingent of medical droids as well as organic non-clone doctors and nurses. Especially lucky Rimsus had Jedi healers as well, who used the force to calm the wounded and heal otherwise unhealable injuries. Now note that we've been saying in theory. In practice, Rimsus were regularly understaffed, under-equipped and swamped with more patients than they could care for. Work in these field hospitals was miserable and to again quote a cut section of the Essential Guide to Warfare, there, organic surgeons and medical droids worked together, often under frantic conditions, to save soldiers' lives, a daily and even hourly task that overworked surgeons grimly called the assembly line. Droids or medical aides would strip incoming critical cases of armor and equipment and deliver them to the operating table. There, Surgeons and a variety of medical droids, 2-1Bs, MD series droids, FX series units and DD-13 chopper droids would deploy instruments and technologies in an effort to save the wounded. Handheld bioscanners diagnosed injuries, antisepsis fields prevented infection, laser scalpels opened up damaged bodies, glue stats closed them up again, and presser fields kept damaged arteries closed. Replacement organs and body parts, either made of clone tissue or taken from dead clones, were close at hand in nutrient tanks. The surgical ward where dead clones donated usable organs for the tanks had the macabre nickname of the discard pile. Conditions aside, most clones that were sent to a Rimsu were either patched up or dead in a few days, unless they were on Drongar, where environmental conditions meant blasters were off the table and vibroblades were the weapon of choice, resulting in a hellhole where not even 15 Rimsus was enough to stem all the bleeding. Those clones that would take more than a few days to recover would be stabilized and then loaded aboard medical frigates, either MedStar class or Pelter class, which would shuttle them off to the Republic's medical stations. These stations, which you might remember from Star Wars The Clone Wars, were Haven class, and there were 20 of them in total, one for each sector army of the GAR. These stations could tend to up to 80,000 clones in critical conditions or with injuries that required long-term recovery, under the care of a mix of medical droids clone medical officers, non-clone doctors, 
and even Kaminoan scientists whose knowledge of the clones' anatomy was obviously unmatched. The mobile surgical units weren't the only kind of standardized, easy to deploy base that the Republic made use of, however. The Republic had a number of standardized models for prefabricated forward operating bases that could easily be deployed on battlefields. We don't know the exact specifications of these, but we do know the specifications of the IM-455 Peacekeeper, a prefabricated garrison base that Rathana Heavy Engineering made for the Empire, from which we can assume that Republic bases most likely had extensive vehicle hangars point defense guns and turbo lasers, possibly shield generators and quarters for hundreds or even thousands of personnel. We do have specifications for a much simpler form of prefabricated Republic installation though, the forward command center. These were prefabricated command posts made to be rapidly deployed onto battlefields by LAAT dropships and from them officers and Jedi generals could manage an entire battlefront. They saw use on Genosis, Christosis and many other battlefields of the Clone Wars and unlike other prefabricated Republic installations, they didn't require any serious assembly work. They came in one piece and could pretty much just be plopped onto the battlefield. Forward command centers were essentially just armored platforms. They were open so as to give commanders hosted there a wide view of the battlefield, but they also had high armored shields that protected seated personnel from incoming fire. Each FCC had a pair of ramps that could be raised to allow for easy boarding from LAAT gunships. Each station was manned by at least two personnel who were seated at consoles at the front of the platform. Behind them was an open space that could hold maybe a dozen more personnel, typically officers or Jedi. The only immediately recognizable feature of the FCC was its towering sensor mast, which collected data from all over the battlefield and relayed it to the forward console, where a pair of clones would be tasked with sorting through the data and updating their commanders on important developments. This allowed the FCC to be the nerve center of Republic operations, tapped into all local Republic communications channels. Commanders in an FCC were aware of where all their troops were at times, and they could coordinate entire armies from these positions with relative ease. FCCs were used to coordinate multi-front engagements, relay targeting information to large artillery columns, and even coordinate refugee relief efforts. For all their utility, FCCs weren't all that common for much of the Clone Wars, as the Jedi Generals preferred to command from the front. They tended to rely more on mobile command centers, which were usually hastily converted cabins in the backs of ATTEs or A6 Juggernauts. These usually packed most of the features of the FCC into a smaller space, though command model ATTEs had the benefit of having a hollow projector table, allowing commanders to more easily visualize troop movements across the battlefield. Now it's time to move on to the final part of the Republic arsenal, its complement of vehicles. This section will be a little different from the ones before because we've analyzed many of these vehicles in exacting detail before and we feel that reiterating that analysis would be straying off topic a little. Instead, we're just gonna be looking at the performance and function of all these vehicles and more importantly, we're gonna be examining how they interacted with the rest of the tech that the Republic used from infantry gear to other armored vehicles. Let's start with a quick look at air support, which blurs the line somewhat between the GAR and the Republic Navy. The Navy and the Republic Starfighter Corps are topics for another time, but there were a few vehicles under their purview that regularly played roles in ground operations. These included the Republic's primary troop transport, the Acclimator class assault ship, which was designed to land on battlefields to deploy its walkers and artillery. In this capacity, Acclimators sometimes served as huge ground bases a purpose that the Kaminoans had specifically intended for them. Also relevant are LAAT gunships. Rathana Heavy Engineering designed the LAAT and its cousins to act as infantry support on top of just serving as transports. Gunships that weren't actively deploying or recovering troops would often be sent to circle the battlefield, attacking targets of opportunity and providing assistance to clones in need of it. As we mentioned earlier, one of the common such jobs gunships carried out was evacuating wounded clones and deploying IM-6s, but the LAAT also played a vital role in communications and coordination. We mentioned earlier that the Republic used its FCCs as the nerve center of Republic battle groups, and LAAT gunships were essentially the eyes of the FCCs. The gunships constantly transmitted sensor data and even video feeds back to the FCC, giving Republic commanders a bird's eye view of the battlefield without having to climb aboard a gunship themselves. 
LAATs were also in constant contact with the computers built into clone helmets, receiving helmet vid feeds, communications, and even updates on the vital signs of clones in the area. The LAAT gunship acted as the link between the troopers on the ground and the forward command centers, relaying orders from command to all the troopers in an area and keeping command appraised of every trooper's status. Now onto the dedicated surface vehicles, beginning with a part of the Republic arsenal we bet you've never seen. It's a water navy. That's right, the Republic had sea ships for use in good old fashioned aquatic warfare. For most of these, we don't know of any battles in which they saw use, but they did exist at the least. The one aquatic vehicle you might be familiar with is the OMS Devilfish Sub, which Republic forces used during the Battle of Moncala. These were simple one-man vehicles meant to essentially act as underwater speeder bikes. Armed with dual blaster cannons and capable of reaching much higher speeds than any clone could swim at, these subs helped level the playing field whenever the clones had to fight underwater, making up for the disadvantages humans have in underwater combat by giving troopers greater speed and firepower. These are the only known underwater vehicles in the GAR arsenal, however, apart from non-combat Kaminoan submersibles. The rest of the Republic's water navy consisted of surface ships. In total, the Republic's water navy consisted of transport ships, scout craft, destroyers, missile launchers, and cruisers. None of these vehicles were actually proper sea ships. Rather, they were repulsor lift craft designed for operation on the surfaces of large bodies of water. Another of these craft, the Republic hoverboat, was actually supposed to appear in Star Wars The Clone Wars. It would have belonged to the Bad Batch and seen use in the early stages of Kashyyyk. The Republic's aquatic transports were the smallest and simplest of the ships in its water navy. They could carry up to 15 clone troopers for transport across bodies of water. Why they existed when LAAT gunships could carry twice that many men much more quickly is a mystery to us. The next largest was the scout ship which came in three variants. The light version, crewed by a single pilot and gunner and armed with a single laser cannon, a heavier version which was faster and better armed and an advanced version, which had more armor. GAR scouts acted more or less as frigates, though, as you could probably guess by their name, they also served in reconnaissance roles. GAR destroyers were slightly larger ships tasked with destroying shore emplacements and enemy vessels using energy pummels. This ship came in two variants, a standard model and a tougher heavy destroyer. There were also GAR missile destroyers, larger anti-airships that kept the fleet safe from incoming starfighters. They were primarily armed with missile launchers, and like their smaller cousins, they came in standard and heavy variants. Lastly, we have the GAR Cruiser, the largest ship in the Republic water fleet. These ships were equipped with large, powerful cannons made for shelling enemy fleets or shore-based installations from long range. As with the Republic's destroyers, there was a heavier variant of the GAR Cruiser as well. We know precious little about how all these watercraft functioned, since we've never seen them in action, but for the most part, they all seem to have been designed to supplement ground forces by targeting enemy fortifications. With that out of the way, we can finally get into the more well-known Republic ground vehicles, beginning with the Grand Army's non-aquatic repulsor craft. These vehicles, a mix of speeders and repulsor tanks, were generally, but not exclusively on the lighter side, used to support the Republic's heavier walkers. Most of these craft were also developed later in the war to fill niches that opened up as the conflict went on, or to supplement the Grand Army's original arsenal. Let's start with the speeders. The Republic had a few models of speeder bike, primarily the 74Z speeder bike, the Bark speeder, the CK6 swoop bike, and the 105K lancer bike. All of these, except the CK6, were produced by Aratec Repulsor Company, a long-time Republic contractor. The Arakid 74Z, which you might know as the Galactic Empire's preferred model of speeder, was a popular model of military speeder bike that was also available to private buyers, while the Bark and the 105K were exclusively produced for the Republic military and Coruscant police. The CK6 Swoop, produced by Bespin Motors, was also Republic military exclusive. The 74Z and the Bark speeder were the most widely used of the GAR's speeder bikes. The 74Z was the lighter of the two models, with only moderate armor plating and a single blaster cannon capable of reaching speeds of up to 500 kilometers per hour. The Bark Speeder was slightly faster and much more heavily armored and armed with four light blaster cannons. Both were one-man speeders, 
though the 74Z could mount a single passenger and the bike speeder could be fielded with an optional sidecar. The two bikes filled more or less the same niche, allowing individual clone troopers, often but not exclusively biker advanced recon commandos, to act in supplemental roles, primarily reconnaissance and fast paced strafing attacks on enemy positions. An LAAT gunship could carry four of either bike, and acclimated class assault ships generally carried 320 each, ensuring that speeder bikes were readily available on most battlefields. Originally, the 74Z was the standard issue Republic speeder bike, while the bike speeder was reserved for the use of ARC troopers and other elite soldiers. However, bike speeders were soon made available to the whole Grand Army, and their superior speed, firepower, and armor meant that they quickly eclipsed the 74Z as the main speeder bike of the Grand Army. It never phased the 74Z out, however, as the lighter bike was cheaper and easier to mass produce. The 74Z was more commonly used for reconnaissance purposes, while the bike speeder's greater durability and stopping power meant that it was typically used for more aggressive purposes. The two classes of speeder saw use side by side until the end of the Clone Wars. The other classes of Republic speeder bike were more specialized. The 105K Lancer bike was a model of high-speed swoop bike loosely based on the 74Z, designed for the use of the Lancer Battalion. It was essentially a more armored and unarmed variant of the 74Z, able to seat a single clone Lancer. These bikes were rarely used due to their extremely niche role. The CK6, meanwhile, was meant to operate in freezing cold temperatures, hence its nickname, the Freco Speeder. These bikes were slightly larger and more heavily armored than the Bark Speeder. They could reach speeds of 550 km per hour and were armed with dual laser cannons. Their design was built around insulating the bike's more delicate systems, as well as its riders, from the cold. The pilot of the CK-6 sat within a fully enclosed, temperature-controlled bubble cockpit and they could operate smoothly in even the fiercest of blizzards, unlike bark speeders or LAAT gunships. However, the CK-6 was expensive and designed for a very specific niche, so it wasn't all that common. When it did see use, it was mostly in the same capacity as the Bark Speeder or 74Z. Next up, we have the Republic's two-person speeder, the ISP or Infantry Support Platform. This underrated little craft was a joint project on the part of Aratech and Ulshos Manufacturing, and you might know it by its nickname, the Republic Swamp Speeder. The ISP was a land speeder designed for operation in waterlogged environments where other repulsor craft might have some trouble. It was based around a larger repulsor lift platform that spread out the craft's weight, and it was powered by a turbofan that could operate more reliably in swamps than ion engines. Two clones, a pilot and a gunner, were required to man the ISP, which boasted a pair of rapid-firing twin blaster cannons, which were good against enemy personnel and light vehicles alike. The ISP was much slower than dedicated speeder bikes, and it filled a very different niche. As its name suggests, it was an infantry support platform meant to provide infantry units with supporting fire. It was a late war addition to the Republic roster meant to complement the Republic's light walkers, which we'll discuss later. During the Clone Wars, the Republic fielded two larger land speeder type craft, the RTT and HAET-221. The RTT, or Republic Troop Transport, was essentially a land speeder version of the LAAT gunship. Produced by Rothana Heavy Engineering, the RTT was minimally armored and could often be sluggish, though for such a small craft it was very well armed, boasting two laser cannons and two mass driver missile launchers, with the latter behind the same kind used on LAAT gunships. RTTs required a pilot and a gunner, and each could carry 12 clone troopers across battlefields. These were very simple craft with a very simple role, tasked with transporting squads of clone troopers to different parts of active battlefields when LAAT gunships were unavailable. They didn't see all that much use, since the LAAT was omnipresent on most battlefields, but they had their niche and filled it well. The HAET-221 gunboat, meanwhile, is the coolest Republic vehicle you've never heard of. This one actually appears in the background of Revenge of the Sith, and it's a crime that it was never seen more. Its name stands for High Altitude Entry Transport, and it was designed by the Mikun Corporation as an alternative to the LAAT, but in practice it functioned as a ground level speeder most of the time. The ship was sleek, fast, well armored and equipped with a wealth of sensors. It required a crew of three, 
consisting of a pilot, co-pilot, and gunner, and it could carry a number of clone troopers in its passenger hold. The HAET-221 was armed with six anti-personnel blasters and a single anti-vehicle laser cannon, giving it a respectable amount of power. The intended niche of the HAET-221 was somewhat unique. It was designed to be launched from low orbit, from which it would rapidly descend onto a planet, using its sophisticated sensors to map out the world's surface as it descended. Once it reached the ground, it would drop off its passengers, and then it would act as a light repulsor tank, as its thrusters weren't powerful enough to take it back into orbit. Introduced before the start of the Outer Rim Sieges, the HAET-221 played an essential role in rapid insertion and infantry support, and it could also act in a secondary reconnaissance role using its powerful sensor suite. All told, it's a bit of an oddball ship, but one with a lot of utility. Moving on, we have the Republic's light repulsor tanks, the TX-130 and the RX-200, both produced by Rathana Heavy Engineering. The TX-130 Sabre Class fighter tank, also known as the Jedi Starfighter of the ground, was a beast of a vehicle. It was designed to balance speed and maneuverability, armor and firepower, and it did so extremely well. It could reach speeds of up to 320 km per hour, could turn on a dime, and it was both well armored and well armed. Its armor was moderately tough, but many TX-130s featured a pair of light shield generators which made the tank much tougher. The TX-130 was armed with two heavy laser cannons, a medium twin laser turret or turreted beam cannon, and a pair of onboard missile launchers. It was manned by a pilot, a co-pilot, and an optional turret gunner, with room for two passengers in the main cabin. Some TX-130s also had on board astromech droids. The TX-130 was extremely effective. A jack of all trades meant primarily for use as armored cavalry or as a fast moving, hard hitting anti armor vehicle. It was, however, hugely expensive, so use of the TX 130 was limited. When it did see action, it acted more or less as a ground based starfighter, flitting across the battlefield and blowing up targets of opportunity. It was a strictly offensive weapon, meant to make the most of its speed and firepower, which meant that it rarely operated as part of larger, slower army units. The RX-200 Falcon-class assault tank, meanwhile, was much more conventional. These repulsor lift artillery tanks were larger, heavier, and slower, crewed by at least one pilot and one gunner. They were heavily armored, protected by a pair of anti-personnel blasters, and they had their own powerful onboard reactors, which were used to power massive ion-based beam cannons. These cannons could rapidly short out deflector shields with sustained fire, and they could also disable starfighters with a single shot. For the most part, they were backline artillery vehicles meant to act as mobile anti-air emplacements or deflector shield disablers. The RX-200 was a niche vehicle, first deployed a few months into the war, but when it saw use it could be devastatingly effective, ensuring Republic air superiority and nullifying otherwise game-changing deflector shields. Lastly, we have the largest repulsor craft in the Republic arsenal, the UTAT or Unstable Terrain Armored Transport. Developed by Kuat Drive Yards in collaboration with the Mikun Corporation, this was a heavy tank meant to serve as alternatives to the ATTE or ATAT on battlefields with unstable terrain where heavy walkers could be a liability. When used, they made up the armored core of the Republic battle groups, advancing with larger columns of infantry against heavily fortified enemy positions. The UTAT floated on a set of repulsor lift skis that could be adjusted to account for the terrain. They were huge and densely armored, about as tough as an ATT. They had spacious internal cabins that allowed the UTATs to serve as troop transports, like the larger walkers they were an alternative to, capable of carrying up to 20 clone troopers, though the exact internal layout of the UTAT is unknown. Operated by at least one pilot and five gunners, the UTAT was extraordinarily heavy armored, more so than both the ATTE and ATAT. Its primary weapon was a top-mounted artillery turbo laser turret, which was supplemented by a pair of side-mounted heavy laser cannons, all of which seemed to have been styled on the primary mass driver of the ATTE. For defense, the UTAT boasted six anti-infantry laser cannons, four turrets mounted on the back, and a pair of fixed guns mounted under the cockpit. All told, the UTAT was one of the most powerful heavy vehicles in the Republic arsenal, a behemoth on par with the Republic's more well-known heavy vehicles. Now let's move on to the stars of the wars, the Republic's vast array of military walkers. 
All of these vehicles were produced by Kuat Drive Yards or its subsidiary Rathana Heavy Engineering and they were all of the famous all-terrain line. These bad boys need no further introduction, so we'll skip the formalities and get right into the analysis. Let's start small, with the Republic's personal walkers. There were two of these, the ATPT and the ATRT, those being the personal transport and recon transport respectively. Both of these walkers were bipedal and operated by a single clone trooper, lightly armed and armoured. The ATPT was the smaller and simpler of the two, and it was one of the very first all-terrain walkers designed before the Grand Army of the Republic was even an idea. It was a small, fairly slow craft designed for a fairly simple purpose, to take a single trooper and give them the firepower of a squad. The ATPE had decent armor, sufficient to protect its pilot from incoming fire, and it was armed with a twin blaster cannon and a small concussion grenade launcher. The ATRT, meanwhile, was slightly larger, much faster, and less durable. Introduced early in the Clone Wars, these light walkers were meant as recon vehicles, but they also served as infantry support units and light attack craft. They were the fastest and nimblest of the Republic's walkers, which made them somewhat difficult to handle. Thus, they were usually only given to clones with specialized training, such as ARF troopers or ATRT drivers, who were trained to ride live mounts first to give them a feel for what riding an ATRT was like. The ATRT was armed with a floodlight and a single repeating blaster cannon. Some models also had small mortar launchers as well. Like the 74Z and Bark Speeder, the ATPT and ATRT were designed for separate roles but ended up serving more or less the same purpose. The ATPT was strictly an infantry support vehicle, while the ATRT was meant as a special issue reconnaissance vehicle restricted to AF troopers. However, the effectiveness of the ATRT meant that it was made available to the whole Grand Army and it ended up taking the ATPT's job. The ATPT was never phased out, but it did end up seeing very little battlefield use after the early months of the war. It saw a bit of a resurgence during the Galactic Civil War after the ATRT was retired, but during the Clone Wars, the ATRT filled the niche of the Republic's premier light walker very effectively. Moving up in scale, we have the Republic's medium walkers, the ATXT and the ATST. Unlike the ATRT and ATPT, which were competing models, the ATXT and ATST were part of the same design lineage. The ATXT, or All Terrain Experimental Transport, was strictly experimental and its design evolved over the course of the Clone Wars. The ATST, or All Terrain Scout Transport, was the final product, premiering at the very end of the conflict. Both walkers were two legged but much larger than the ATPT or ATRT, with well armored cabins. Neither could stand up to sustain fire, but they made effective light tanks as they could take a few hits, had respectable firepower, and were pretty fast for their size. The ATXD was a single pilot craft equipped with a plasma shield generator, a chin mounted double laser cannon, and twin proton grenade launchers. The ATST, meanwhile, was an unshielded two man vehicle armed with a chin mounted twin blaster cannon, a light side mounted E web heavy repeater and a side-mounted concussion grenade launcher. Both walkers had roughly the same amount of firepower, give or take, and they both usually acted as high-mobility, light-armored vehicles, supporting heavily armored units or acting as the core of smaller, faster-moving infantry units. The ATST was also a capable scout vehicle, hence its name. The most well-known Republic vehicle by a long shot is the ATTE, the All-Terrain Tactical Enforcer. ATTEs were designed to be the primary armored vehicle of the JAR from the very beginning, with a prominent place in the Republic's standard battle plan. These six-legged, heavily armored behemoths acted as the cause of large Republic battle groups, giving them the firepower they needed to blast through all but the most powerful separatist armies. ATTEs were also designed to function as troop transports, and over the course of the Clone Wars, they were used in many other, more unorthodox ways as well. The ATTE was manned by a single pilot, a spotter, and five gunners, and it had two main cabins that could carry 20 troopers into battle in its default configuration. The rear cabin could also be converted into a command center or a storage hold for a pair of ATRTs. ATTEs were heavily armored, if sluggish, and they were well armed, boasting a single turreted mass driver cannon for long-range bombardment and six anti-personnel laser cannons. 
The design was wildly successful, a symbol of the Grand Army of the Republic from the Battle of Geonosis to the war's end. But the ATTE wasn't perfect, and the Republic also fielded a number of other heavy walkers based loosely on its design, meant to account for some of its flaws or act in a more specialized role. The deployment of these new walkers meant the ATTE decreased in use as the Clone Wars went on, though it was never even remotely close to being phased out. Two specialized heavy walkers based on the ATTE were the ATAP and ATOT. Both of these were designed for specific niches and meant to operate alongside other armored vehicles, such as ATTEs or Juggernaut tanks. The ATAP was a three legged heavy walker meant as a mobile artillery piece, taking the firepower of the ATTE and putting it in a smaller package. Manned by a pilot and two gunners, the ATAP boasted a powerful, ultra long range mass drive cannon, a turreted heavy blaster cannon, and an anti personnel medium laser cannon. It was meant to operate from the back line of a Republic army, and though it moved on two legs, it had to deploy a third leg to lock it into place to fire its main gun due to the weapon's sheer power. The ATOT, meanwhile, was an armored troop transport with an open hold on its back. This eight legged vehicle required a single pilot, and it could transport a total of 59 clone troopers into battle, 34 of whom could be seated, and the rest of whom could remain standing. The Walker was lightly armed, with two medium laser cannons on the front and two anti personnel laser cannons on the rear. But its firepower could be supplemented by its clone passengers, who could fire on enemy droids from the back of the vehicle. As a dedicated transport, the ATOT was never meant to see frontline use, but it could defend itself if the need arose. Lastly, we have the Republic's two heaviest walkers, the ATHE and ATAT. These were designed to replace the ATTE entirely, though they only saw limited use toward the end of the war. They were designed to account for the main weakness of the ATTE, which that it was low enough to the ground for mines to be able to seriously damage its undercarriage. Both the ATHE and ATAT compensated for this by being very tall. Little is known about the ATHE, the all-terrain heavy enforcer, apart from its longer legs and heavy firepower. Of course, that's not the case for the all-terrain armored transport, the infamous AT-AT. The AT-AT, as seen in the Battle of Hoth, didn't premiere until the Galactic Civil War, but the Republic used prototype versions of it in certain battles, which had more or less the same specifications, if weaker armor. These great war machines walked on four legs, were driven by a crew of five, and had cabin space in their densely armored main holds for 40 troopers. Armed with a pair of fire-linked heavy laser cannons and a pair of medium blaster cannons, the AT-AT was one of the most powerful vehicles in the Republic arsenal, rivaled only by the Juggernaut. That leads us into our final section, which concerns Juggernaut tanks and artillery pieces. There were several classes of Juggernaut, all of which were wheeled, heavily armored, and huge. There was the A5 Juggernaut, which was about the size of an ATTE, but the most well-known was the HAVW A6 Juggernaut, a 50 meter long rolling slab of armor and weapons. Manned by a crew of 20, the A6 Juggernaut could carry up to 300 clone troopers at a time, acting as a mobile command post and heavy tank. These monsters were heavily armored and they boasted one heavy laser cannon turret, one rapid repeating laser cannon, two medium anti-personnel laser cannons, two twin blaster cannons, and two heavy rocket launchers. They were the second largest vehicles in the JAR, only short of the SPHAT. The Republic had several variants of self-propelled heavy artillery, but the SPHAT was the most common. These enormous walkers required crews of 25 clones, and they were extremely well armored too, tougher than anything else the GAR had. They were also very slow due to their massive size, and they had the added disadvantage of being too big for LAAT dropships to carry, requiring the assault ships carrying them to land on a planet's surface to deploy them. However, the SPHAT made up for these shortcomings with sheer firepower. Each one boasted 12 anti-personnel blasters for anti-infantry defense, but its main weapon was an enormous turbo laser capable of shooting down Trade Federation core ships. Other variants of SPHAT walkers boasted ion cannons, mass drivers, anti-vehicle lasers, or concussion missile launchers. The Republic did have smaller artillery pieces as well, AV-7 anti-vehicle cannons. Manned by a single gunner, these cannons stood on four legs that could be used for quick repositioning. 
They also featured repulsor lifts to move them from location to location. These weapons fired anti-vehicle shells cocooned in energy, which were powerful enough to pulverize an armored assault tank with a single shot. And with that, we've finally come to the end of the GAR arsenal. We hope you've enjoyed this deep dive of ours, but what do you think? We bet there's at least something we've covered today that you haven't heard before. Feel free to let us know in the comments what it was. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.